Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome back to BOSC. I'm Monica Munoz Torres, and I'm an associate professor of biomedical informatics at the School of Medicine in the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Um, it is my immense pleasure to welcome our panelists today. They will introduce themselves as the, as the panel goes. First, I have a little bit of logistics. Andrew, Barry, Melanie, Thomas, could I kindly ask you that you please give verbal consent to be recorded during the panel? Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> you got it. Um, you know, we have been, it is, it's become a bit of a tradition to come in and have a little bit of a discussion as we summarize the events of the, of the two days that brings us uh, into BASC. And so we have fantastic keynote speakers. We had great talks throughout. And, and now we're going to grab all of that information and try to, to condense and pick their brains a little further into getting a little bit more into um, the topic of our panel. We, we know that there's still a need for powerful analytical tools. Um, it's been greater now. It's never been greater. And what I want us to do during the panel as you ask questions, as you think about this and ask our panelists, is to dive into the open source AI ML world so that we can explore its potential to revolutionize biological information analysis. Um, the shift that occurred towards open source bioinformatics promised and I truly believe has delivered in great part um, an era of transparency, of collaboration, uh, faster innovation, and, and implementing open source practices for artificial intelligence and machine learning and deploying this comes as a natural progression of this open source movement. So we think this is important. It helps us to democratize access. Uh, it helps us to accelerate discovery, but it also has its challenges. Andrew and Melanie spoke about these challenges yesterday and today. Uh, open models rely on public available data, there could be some limitations on the on diversity, on, on biases that are introduced, and there could also be constraints regarding um, the ability to you know, uh, pursue funding and achieve funding for computational analysis, for instance. Uh, so over the course of the next hour or so, <laughs> a little bit less than that, um, we will go over a few questions. I will start us off with an icebreaker so that you get a feeling for the dynamics. Uh, and then our panelists respond, not all four at a time, but one or two of them so that we have the possibility of bringing in a lot more questions. So please have a think about this open source AI ML, whether it's a game changer for bioinformatics and start uh, preparing your questions. You can come up to the mic. If you have a piece of paper, you can write them out and I'm happy to read them. Um, I believe Karsten's online on the, on the Juno platform, so you can write uh, q and A in there as well, and then we'll be uh, trying to address as many questions as possible. For the next twelve minutes, our panelists are going to introduce themselves briefly, and that's why I'm not introducing you. So please take it away, Thomas. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Monica. I'm uh, Thomas Mwa. I'm a researcher in residence at the Expertise Center of uh, AI here in Montreal. Uh, but uh, my presence here will be mostly related to my practical work uh, in Cameroon with uh, the biohacker space I founded called the Moa Lab in 2017. Uh, I think uh, from my experience uh, trying to develop local, local solution, uh, working in synthetic biology and uh, in digital fabrication, uh, then the shift to the AI in 2020 uh, with practical work in uh, uh, biology, I think I will share with you some point. But I believe, I strongly believe that um, <laughs> combining uh, AI, responsible AI, and uh, open source is a powerful tool specifically for uh, low resources low context in terms of uh, accelerating biology and uh, diagnostics. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thomas Mboa? Um, works here in Montreal, hails from Cameroon, I believe. And um, I wanted to share that he is, that the four panelists are sitting at a long table. Uh, Dr. Mboa sits with a beige color blazer and uh, glasses. And next to him is Melanie Courteau, who sports uh, short blonde hair and glasses with a burgundy coat. Please. Nice. <laughs> All right, thanks, Moni. Uh, thanks so much for uh, 
the intro. The, uh, hi, so I'm Melanie Corto. If you were here for the, the first day of BOSC, you've heard me talk about some of the, uh, the ideas and the concerns I have around AI and open AI and LLM and what's going to happen to, to us as humans. Um, I work at OICR, the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. So we do a lot of cancer genomics. So there's all the consideration around private data, confidential patient data. So that's also something, you know, we're talking about open source and open data. Should all the data be open for the data that's not open? How do we handle that? Uh, some of the things that I'm particularly concerned about is the, the data and the data quality that we're leveraging when we run, you know, whether it's AI, ML, or any other uh, automated classifier, or anything like that. Um, we fell lens in particular, you know, Andrew was showing us this morning the, the amount of data that we can actually handle. So is there, you know, that self-fulfilling loop that I was talking about? Are we going to start erasing data, rewriting the data history, become one of those ministry of truth where, you know, we just rewrite what we actually want to see. So maybe that's something that, you know, has data generator and manipulator we need to, to think about. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, I'd be, I'd be interested in talking about uh, responsible and understandable AI, which I think Thomas is an expert in, uh, data quality, and how can we uh, handle privacy and confidentiality uh, in an open source context. Thank you, Melanie. To the left of Melanie sits uh, Dr. Larry Hunter with a playful, beautiful set of curls and a black shirt with white markings. I was wondering how you were going to handle this. This is traditional Hawaiian uh, markings, by the way. Beautiful. Um, I'm Larry Hunter. Uh, I'm about to start as a professor in the School of Medicine at the University of Chicago. Uh, I spent 20 some odd years at the University of Colorado and before that was at NIH. Um, it, I, I graduated with a PhD in AI right at the last AI winter in the <laughs> late 80s and early 1990s. So I have some experience with the hype cycle. And I like to think that with <laughs> my advanced age and horrible experiences, I can bring some moderate perspectives to, to keep people from panicking, but still take advantage of the opportunities that we have. And I guess if I were going to lay out um, a, a piece of ideology to, to direct our thinking, um, I might, uh, and this is a, it's not my idea originally, but, um, and I'm not sure whose it was, it circulated as a meme, so it's a little hard to track down the provenance. It's a problem for all y'all. Um, but I want uh, AI to do the dishes and the laundry so that I can write <laughs> stories and make music rather than the other way around. <laughs> uh, and I think in science we can do that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, the role of, of uh, language models and creativity and, and uh, what we might be able to get out of them productively. Uh, some worries about uh, the need to use open ones and the problems with using closed uh, language model systems, even though they, the open ones might not be quite as performant in some ways, um, it is possible to do science with them. And I will argue in a few minutes, I think, that it's actually impossible to do science with the closed models because there's too many important things we don't know about. And it's, it's okay to report on them, um, but it is not adequate just to report on them. And um, I think I'll let it go for that. Thank you, Larry. And last but not least, to the left of Larry sees Dr. Andrew Su. He is also in the United States as Larry, and he's wearing a polo shirt with a purple tint and glasses. Um, thanks. Um, right, so my name is Andrew Su. I'm a professor at Scripps Research in San Diego. Uh, my lab is really interested in uh, bioinformatics methods. We have you know, a longstanding history in, in open source software less so in sort of AI, but of course we're trying to do uh, sort of a crash course and and get up to, to speed. Uh, I think we will always be more on the side of, of applications as opposed to uh, developing. Um, I, I have the challenge of trying to say something unique uh, uh, relative <laughs> to the esteemed colleagues uh, to my right. Um, and perhaps the only thing I'll, I'll add just to sort of a basis is um, sort of the, the role of, of uh, sort of, I, I think the the need and the role of education in 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 all this, um, because I think there is, you know, not only among sort of pra AI practitioners, uh, but also in terms of uh, sort of the broader public and and how uh, these uh, findings that are based on AI can be properly 
uh, contextualized and, and interpreted. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you all for your introductions. Um, a point of technical, these microphones are very good at capturing voice at 45 degree angle, so you don't have to bring them too close. They actually get a little bit of reverb if you do. Um, I just learned that from Seth. Um, okay, so we'll we'll start with the first question uh, to carry for for as many of you as you'd like to share. Um, I'm wondering if you can start us off uh, with some outlook on what are the most exciting opportunities that you see the concept of open source AI ML can bring uh, for future research. Um, if you would like to share some insight on that, and who would like to start? I think that's a question for Andrew, based on all the, the Mansi Meta uh, survey. You've been yeah, voluntold, Andrew. Don't pull that up again, but uh, <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll defer to others. Sure, I'm happy. The Please. most exciting for me is, you know, the impact it's going to have on all of us. So when Andrew was doing the, the survey this morning, I was trying to think about 10 years in the future, I'm like, oh, it's going to be great. We're going to have precise precision medicine. We're going to know exactly what's happening with the environment. We're going to have solution for agriculture, climate change. It's going to be amazing. And then, you know, we were talking about some of the issues with models, AI, the data coming in. I'm like, hey, is it going to be amazing? So really excited about seeing what's going to happen. I'm, I think there's a huge potential for, you know, betterment of humankind but there's also a huge potential for risk and challenges. And because you're asking for the positive, I will focus on the positive and I will say, I think that's really an opportunity to handle the, you know, the data tsunami to cite the data. Everything that's happening, there's really an opportunity to handle that data, make something amazing with it. And I'm really looking forward to it. That's a potential it goes wrong, but positive. Cheers. All right, well, so in the spirit of the laundry and dishes <laughs> remark, um, what I'm excited by is actually sort of the more routine uses of language models to make our, our work less painful and, and more efficient. And I can think of a variety of ways of things that, that that can happen. So often for my own use, when I want a quick summary of some gene or field or something that I don't know that much about, where I used to turn to Wikipedia, I now sometimes uh, turn to a language model for a quick summary of something. And it's particularly the case when there isn't a simple idea that, you know, was likely to have a single Wikipedia entry, but a somewhat more complicated thing that I want some background on. I find it useful for that. There are, uh, in, in my lab, I have occasionally encouraged students who are not uh, uh, native speakers of English and have some issue with writing um, to take their uh, draft manuscripts and, and ask um, a language model to rephrase them or improve the, the, um, the English and uh, then look at them and try and learn from that, uh, not just blindly submit, but actually try and learn about that. And, and I think that that's likely to work. Um, there have been two, as far as I know, uh, really good large scale studies of the applications of language models in real work situations. And the first one's about six months old from the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, which looked at the application of large language model in a technical support, phone technical support application for software product. Rolled it out, there were, um, I forget the exact number, but hundreds of employees. Um, and over the period of the study, the, um, the productivity of, the, of that you know, helpline went up by about 20%, not quite, high double digits, 17, 18%. Um, and that's meaningful, but if you break it down a little further, um, what was interesting to me was the people who were the least productive before the introduction of the language model got the biggest benefit. So the ones that took the longest time to look up the answer and to report back on what it was got a significant improvement. The top quintile, the people who were in the top 20% actually had a minor decrement in their performance. It took them longer when they had to use the language model, but overall for the entire population, it went up some. So, uh, and furthermore, one other interesting thing about the study is when they took the language model away, it was a 30 day experiment, the people who were at that low level continued to improve, to show improved performance. They learned what the appropriate answers were and they remembered them and they could generate them themselves without having to use the language model. So I think that's a nice way of thinking about how can we put these things to use in a way that kind of lifts all boats, being aware of some of the consequences. And I'm not sure exactly what the applications in science would be to look like that but I think there are some. 
Thank you, Larry. I don't yet see people lining up or questions on the online, so I would like to give uh, ask Toma and Andrew to share the opportunities of uh, you know what are the opportunities that this can afford that open AI ML can afford for biological research. Um, Toma, would you like to share some thoughts? Yes. So I, I, I see um, good potential in terms of uh, collaboration and uh, acceleration of. Uh, research because what I know from what I know in the realm of uh, open uh, uh, science or <coughs> open source all our action everywhere so depending of uh, where we have can have a consequence uh, where, and uh, one uh, positive consequence is uh, uh, the collaboration how uh, our action can contribute to the democratization of uh, of uh, sciences or science or biology. If I take the case of uh, GitHub as a platform, how GitHub or GitLab, or depends on what you are using, have facilitated our work uh, in uh, Cameroon just because you have access to this, all these uh, open repository, you can reproduce uh, a very complex experiment uh, related to synthetic biology, for example, from Cameroon, just because you have all the protocol available. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity for collaboration and uh, acceleration because synthetic biology is something that uh, when you are looking at uh, our capacity, technical, uh, infrastructure, and so on, something that we, we we are not really able to do from Cameroon, but we succeed, we succeed to, in uh, doing this kind of uh, research and uh, experiment. Um, so that is what I can say for from uh, uh, the Cameroonian context. Yeah. Thank you, Tuma. Um, maybe one use case that I think is, is exciting from my perspective is, is sort of the, the curation assistance, um, right? So, so I think, you know, in my keynote, I talked a little bit about how we're interested in utilizing the structured resources from the LLMs or the resources of the LLMs, but, but sort of the reverse of that, using LLMs to help populate structured resources. I think there's sort of still uh, value and, and, and use cases associated with that. And, and um, so that's also something that, that we're looking at in terms of, you know, trying to construct focused knowledge graphs, um, for example, in specific areas. Thank you, Andrew. A little more to your right, and you'll see the microphone. And one step more to your right. There you go. So I want to, uh, you know, thinking about the last few days, we've heard a lot about some of the ways that the use of LLMs in general, and even in some cases, open LLMs, thinking about Melanie's talk, um, could actually be somewhat detrimental in terms of equity. So I, I want to hear the other side of that coin a little bit as well. So I'm wondering if you can give us one way in which the use of open LLMs and open data in open bioinformatics sphere could increase equity for the people who benefit from the from that use. And maybe one case where it will potentially, if we're not careful, decrease equity for who benefits from that science. Sure, thanks, Andrew. Um, so I think, you know, I think Larry touched a little bit on open versus closed LLMs. The, so I see open LLMs as a, as a fantastic opportunity in terms of anyone can use them and run them and try them and it works or it doesn't work. But you can, you can try a series of LLMs as, you know, nowadays as APIs where you can just switch the model in the back end. And so that's, that's a huge opportunity in terms of trying uh, different things. And that means that you also have those tiny and smaller models that anyone could start using on their laptops, which means in terms of increasing equity and access to resources, you can think about uh, countries who have uh, lower um, infrastructure or resources available, and you can, you, you can take your laptop, it's maybe a little bit slow, but you can take that laptop and you can actually use the model. So in terms of increasing equity by increasing access to the technology, I think that's a fantastic opportunity for uh, open models in particular. Um, and then your second question was around where it could, sorry. Where it could do harm. Where it could do harm. You just, you just said a benefit, yeah. Yeah, do you want to take the harm? Oh, 
No, I want to say one more good thing. Okay. No, I can, I can, I can, I can <laughs> come up with some harms. Uh, so I, I like thinking about them really as language technology. So one place that I think LLMs have a really important role in improving equity is in lesser resource languages. So the, the machine translation works much better than it ever has. LLMs are an important part of that. And it makes the scientific literature available to people who speak lesser resource languages. And I think that's really important. Um, and so machine translation generally, but LLM based machine translation in particular is important. And also I mentioned briefly before the flip side of that, helping uh, authors whose language isn't whose first language is necessarily English improve the quality of their manuscripts. Um, so just thinking of it as language technology, I think gives us some insight into one way it might help improve equity. Um, I'm a little less convinced about access. It's still too expensive, but uh, maybe that's a downside piece that if everybody gets used to it and it costs 20 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month is not so much to a North American lab, uh, maybe a lot more to a lab in the uh, uh, less rich part of the world. Yeah, I, so when I, you know, when I was a, a student and starting my career, there was a really sequencing technologies were taking up and it was the, the time at which you could take like a, a USB like a USB key like sequencer and plug it in your laptop. And I had a colleague, uh, Nick Lohman in the, in the UK in particular, was traveling the world and sequencing on site. And I think I've been really inspired for that. So I guess that's what I'm hoping to see with with all. So the open source ones might be free on my laptop. It could happen. Um, cool. Other thoughts? Yeah. I Please. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I think uh, I recognize this uh, the potential in terms of uh, participation and uh, contribution uh, that uh, Open LLM uh, provide. Uh, but the the other side, I think I, I just like to show some example in terms of harms. Uh, uh, the other side is uh, when we look at the the, the level of contribution of uh, people, for example, based in uh, low and middle income countries, I think the level of knowledge they can contribute in uh, all this data set and so on is not the same uh, that the people are contributing across the world. And uh, uh, we, we, we documented this uh, issue in the past through a project that we did in the Francophone Africa and in Haiti. Uh, and we believe that it what we call it's what we call uh, uh, cognitive injustice, and this cognitive injustice are not coming uh, just from um, the, the 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 most important of them are inner are coming from the inner from uh, our local issue where we don't have if you decide to count the number of people using uh, LLM in Cameroon for example they are not we don't have a critical mass. So it means that they cannot contribute as much as we want, so that our knowledge are also available um, on the internet as uh, they can change the narrative around our countries, our diseases, and so on. So that is, uh, I think, is something that we need to, is an arm, but we need to try to target it from the inner, from uh, our context, I think. Because I strongly believe that the, uh, the technology is open, so it's up, and, uh, it's up to everyone to try to embrace, to develop new skills uh, and uh, adopt in uh, our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, practice. But locally, we are lacking a critical mass, and the consequence is that we there's a lot of biases when we uh, want to talk about uh, different contexts rather than uh, North America and Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have been thinking about the, the possibilities. You know, you touched a little bit on the possible challenges, the reliance on public data, the, the fact that there might be some lack of uh, diversity in the data themselves, uh, the challenges with being able to, to run these resources because you don't have sufficient funds to be able to, to do this. Uh, so these are all challenges that are posed to the utilization of open AI ML resources. How do you think some of those can be, how can we affect some change? What could be done to maybe change some of those things, the reliance on the publicly available data, the, the biases, the, um, 
it, all of these different challenges. Uh, do, does anybody want to go first and share some thoughts? I'll take a stab because I, I was I was thinking a lot, Moni, about you, you know your your analogy to open source software, right? And I think open source software uh, made a lot of sense because we could um, write the primary ingredient, right? The effort involved is is human effort, right? And so, um, given enough uh, people and, and expertise, right, we, we, we can approximate a lot of sort of previously commercial software. Um, but with, you know, I, I just wonder whether or not um, in the AI space where, for example, right, especially the, 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 the closed models of LLMs, right, I mean, it, it's, it's impractical, right, to do that in an, in an open source way. Um, or, or at best, we'll get subsets of that data. And um, you know, even the the open source models where you know the weights in the models, right? It's still the underlying training data, data is, is still often closed, right? And so that makes it difficult to introspect as far as um, you know what the potential biases are in there, for example. So um, yeah, I, I I don't I I find it difficult because. To, to think of the solution there, because again, it seems like in, um, in contrast to software, the, where the primary ingredient is, is human effort, uh, right? There's, there's, there's a lot more sort of resource intensivity that would be difficult to, to replicate in an open uh, context. I respectfully disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. I know. <laughs> we were getting really boring. <laughs> uh, so, I want to make two points, um, and one is going to be close to Newcastle. I don't think you could do science of a certain kind on closed models. If you don't know what the training data was, you can't analyze what the influence of various aspects of that training data was on the, on the model. If you want to investigate the sources of bias in the data, you have to know the training data, yeah. right? So, there's a whole bunch of scientific questions about language models that cannot be answered in a, a closed context. So if we're gonna make progress on addressing some of these issues, if we're going to understand um, how the models are, you know, what are the influences of the training data on the outputs? Uh, how can we make models that run faster, use fewer resources, train faster? Those kind of questions require open models. Um, by the way, I also, I guess this is the moment to do it. I wanna drop my, the bomb that I have about why not to use closed models. And that is not just because we don't know what's in them, but because they are actively working against our interests. So remember how many billions of dollars have been invested in companies like OpenAI and Anthropic and the like, okay? Those investors are not doing it for our benefit. They are doing it for return on that investment. And as far as I can tell, the subscription model helps a little bit, but the real payoff, like every other piece of payoff in tech is advertising. So the answers you're going to get out of large language models will increasingly be purchased by advertisers who want to deliver a message to you. Okay, that is no way to do science, all right? We can't even tell that they're there. We won't know what the consequences were. It will drive them towards commercial utility and away from objectivity and science. So we have to come up with some way of dealing with the fact that the incentives of the closed providers do not align with the incentives of scientists. And I think the way to do that is openness. And the place I want to disagree with you is I think we can get there with open models. It may take longer. I think what we need to answer your question is patience. The open models are likely to lag behind the performance of the closed models, but not by that much. Current open models are better than three, GPT 3.5 for a lot of applications. It didn't take that long to catch up. And so I think we need to, we need to be patient and use open models. But open models in terms of being able to see the weights or open models? In data, training, including the data, yeah. including the data. Um, and, you know, maybe there will be places where we cannot do that, although I don't think they're going to be that important scientifically. The main one is actually with these video generative models. So most of the video generative models that are happening are being trained on YouTube data. Certainly all of Google's are, and there was a cross-licensing agreement. Uh, so it, look, it looks like a lot of the video training is going to be on YouTube data. And that's copyrighted and you can't have it. Um, so I'm not sure what we're going to do about open video models. Mm. But for the language yeah. models, plenty of open data. And in fact, there's some evidence that performance of models trained on high quality language data 
trained on PubMed Central or, or journal articles, even much smaller models in terms of the amount of training data and the number of parameters perform better in biomedical applications with higher quality training data, journal articles alike, rather than the common crawl. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I That's a very good discussion about this topic. And I'm going to shift us a little bit because we just received one new question and I want to make sure that we have opportunity. So online, um, Jonathan Kinney is here and he wrote a question uh, online. Is it realistic? Is it a realistic concern that AI models might enable skirting laws? For example, maybe a health insurance company cannot deny coverage for some reason, but their AI model effectively does this even with guardrails. This example is too contrived by thinking about it. Uh, if AI guardrails may not be able to capture the spirit of law effectively enough. So is it realistic that it might enable skirting? I don't know of a technology that doesn't enable crime. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> criminal intent is criminal intent and criminals are clever. Um, and bad things will happen with all technologies. And for that matter, not with technology. You could, you know, you could be scammed by somebody with a telephone and it doesn't mean we need to shut off all the telephones. Um, now, you know- Okay, there, that's a very good point. There are, yeah, there, we don't have to shut them There's off. some concern um, that it might facilitate really bad action. So mm -hmm. I hang out with some national security people and the first thing they all thought of is, well, can large language models help terrorists build, you know, germ weapons or something like that? And it turns out that, yeah, sort of, although not that much different than using Wikipedia. All right. So the, the information is out there. It has to be pretty common for the language model to come up with an answer. You could try and put guardrails around uh, hazardous substances and the like. So if you ask it how to synthesize anthrax, you're not going to get an answer. Um, but in, in general, it's impossible to fix all of that stuff. And yeah. it's, it, I don't think it's unique to large language models. It's, you know. Yeah, not all that different, probably just faster. Um, Tamar or Melanie, do you have some thoughts on this? Uh, on this? No, no, no. I don't <laughs> I don't think the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take a chance of disagreeing with Ferry. <laughs> but uh, no, I think that you know the the potential for harm is always there, whichever the technology. The, the only the only thing that we can do is so, you know there's the legislation, there's the legal guardrail. Again, you know if somebody wants to wants to not follow the law, they're going to do it, right? Like especially if there's money behind, like insurance companies and stuff like that. Um, the only thing that we can do, and you know, to go back to the discussion we had earlier, is understand why this happened. Understand mm -hmm. if we're using open technology, we have a potential of looking inside and you know, understanding where did that data come from, where what did the algorithm do, and why did it draw that conclusion, and can we do better, maybe safeguarding the data, or modifying the algorithm. And I think the, you know. Money is a big factor, and even in general in open source, Larry said we need to be patient and stuff will catch up. But for the open source community, for the open source software we all develop, what's working is we can reuse the software, it saves us time and money. So th th there's, a, there's a notion, I think, of incentive, you know, why do we want to do that? And where is the incentive going to come from? So if it's about not doing laundry, yes, yeah, sign me up. That's that, there's that little robot in my hotel that apparently does room service. So that's clearly an incentive of saving somebody's the effort of having to do room service and going to interact with people and who wants to interact with people. But, you know, there's a notion of when we're talking about higher level tasks and, you know, we're talking about medicine, human health, insurance and law, how much do we want to, to trust AI and how much do we want to to be patient and wait for stuff to happen. How much do we, as an open source community, want to drive the development mm. because we think that's where we need to go? Yeah. But I want to bounce back on uh, the yes. legislation as, uh, aspect. I think legislation works very well when we all agree that is uh, it need to be contextualized. Uh, legislation need to be contextualized because, and that is what happening now. A lot of uh, legislation in place trying to fix uh, the issue of uh, biases and so on are more global legislation. And this cannot really work uh, for each context because something that you think is uh, a problem uh, for our context here in North America is not the, the it's not a problem in Africa, for example. 
Uh, last time we tried to, we, we had a project on uh, breast cancer and tried to work with uh, uh, an algorithm developed uh, here. But the data used to train this algorithm was uh, data from uh, America, US specifically. And when we tried to, to, to test uh, this uh, algorithm in, with uh, Cameroon, uh, Cameroonian woman, women, we don't have um, the accurate results, you know. And the first thing is that we don't, we are lacking uh, data, relevant data coming from uh, our context. So when, when we try to start collecting data um, in hospital, uh, but our gun stops because uh, even we, if you want to collect data, we have to, to go, uh, against uh, the data privacy and so on that is uh, very uh, well set up in us for example so i think it's an issue and uh, for in order to have this uh, application or this algorithm uh, be relevant for our context i think collecting data is the first thing to do even if uh, it's prohibited the way we wanted to do it uh, in uh, is forbidden in us but in Cameroon, for example it can be okay and can, it can help us uh, uh, improve uh, the algorithm based on our needs so the regulation sometimes we need to uh, i think we need to contextualize it mm. can i ask a question to, Thank you, Emma, to yeah. the audience so you know we're talking about regulation and there's, there's regulations that say, you know, you're not supposed to use ChatGPT to write your grant, or you're not supposed to use ChatGPT as a cover on a manuscript. And, you know, there's a bunch of funding agencies that have come up with regulations saying you shall not use large language model to do A, B, and C. How, how realistic do you think that is? Do you, do you think it's something that can be prevented? Who's, you know, Who's used prevented AI? or shepherded through, right? Adapted to either option? There was a lovely paper that NIPS did, right? I, I'm sorry, Neural NeurIPS um, did on um, looking at language model use in the last NeurIPS conference. And uh, they used the, there's some, some words that show up in language models that are uncommon um, outside <laughs> of language models. Delve is the one that's most well known. Um, and so they looked at the presence of those words in abstracts and reviews. Um, and uh, it, was, it was nice that they did it in a way that was non-judgmental. It was really trying to, we couldn't identify anyone in particular. Sometimes people use the word delve and it wasn't a language model. They really weren't trying to do any sort of enforcement, just gather data. And there were a couple of interesting things about it. So there was, there was a larger number of reviews that looked like they came from chat GPT than <laughs> papers, okay? So people are being fairly careful about the papers. There were some papers that looked like they had chat GPT signatures. Um, and then they looked at the characteristics of the reviewers to see what were, were there anything they could find that would identify the kind of person who would do that thing. <laughs> um, and it turned out the demographics were useless. The thing that was most highly predictive was that this, the review was submitted in the two days before the deadline. <laughs> oh, my word. I so I think we need to recognize that there are pressures on people um, and that sometimes they will drive, that those pressures will drive people to do things that we wish they, they weren't. And I think the appropriate reaction to that uh, is to try and acknowledge and, and provide alternatives, extensions to the deadline, things like that, um, that, you know, address the problem sociologically rather than technically. Yeah, I, I personally also feel that there are opportunities to actually do this in a way that you can incorporate and leverage the power what the LLM can give the student and, and help them uh, shepherd their work through it. Um, I actually encouraged my students, I mean, if they wanted to use it, I was not going to stop them from it, but we gave them guardrails on, on what kinds of things they could do. Sure, write your bullet points, but don't give me your entire paper done with it kind of kind of thing. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a really interesting one. So uh, I'm a, uh, personally, I'm aware of the use of, uh, of what I thought was a clever use of ChatGPT in an undergraduate context, which was, uh, it was a, a series of uh, essay prompts, right, for the students to write papers or essays. Um, and along with the essay prompt came 
the response in the exam came the response from chat gpt ah. um and then they respond the the question was what's right and what's wrong with this and tell me tell me what it's missing and i thought that was a lovely way to go about doing it, it doesn't work in all contexts but it, it worked in some yeah and then there was a, a paper that i just saw came out in the last few days looking at the use in high school classrooms and there it was disastrous so there it really seemed to in to interfere with um uh, learning so students were allowed to use them they used them uh, they discussed it in class and then when they took the the chatbots away and did exams they performed less well than students who hadn't used them so i think that's a cultural environment yeah. we have to encourage students to use their critical thinking to not just you know take the output and copy paste all that sort of stuff we have to develop an ethos around how we're going to continue to be good educators in the with the presence of these things in the world we did it with calculators we could do it with language models yes. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Please uh, state your name uh, oh, before the question. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, yeah, John Hill. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, uh, to the earlier point about bias, I've seen bias and uh, sort of erroneous logic and things like this framed in the models in terms of something to be corrected in terms of adjusting the training data, making more representative, things like this. Um, I wanted to hear the panel's thoughts on whether the models themselves could be sort of a model or studyable system for the training data. So can you use, sort of flip it around and say, oh, we've got an LLM that's trained on this data set. We don't know all the biases and thoughts and that, but now maybe we can poke this system a little bit and sort of figure out what's going on. Has there been much work in that direction? Who wants to answer that? It's Somebody. an interesting idea. I'm not aware of anybody who's done that. Are you, is anybody? I mean, you could you could use it as a, especially if you had smaller ones, right? If you had more limited training sets, you could imagine using it as a summarization of the training set and say, you know, mm, it's sexist or it's racist or something. Right. I think it's pretty clear that they are. If you just take the common crawl, there's a lot of really bad stuff in there, and I, you know, you can kind of use the outputs of language models as a weird characterization of the bad stuff on the internet. I'm not sure how valuable it is, but you know, maybe you could do that. <laughs> I have seen some uh, questions online that gyrate about the same theme. If you have some uh, bullet points or pointers towards what are some good open source LLMs that can be used, uh, if should we please list them? Is there an open model that has been trained on PubMed? Could we please list them? So if, if you have knowledge of these, I, I would be happy to The Hugging Face them. leaderboard is the best place to go. Hugging Face? Hugging Face. So Hugging Face has a leaderboard that has all kinds of performance statistics and it's got metadata that describes how open the models are. Is it, is it weights? Is it training data? You know, what the training data was. Hugging Face is a wonderful resource for that stuff. Thank you. Please state your name before the question. Yes. Matthew Lavalley Adam, University of Ottawa. Um, I was wondering about the, from an environmental perspective, the open versus closed models. So you would think that open model would help reusage and then for less retraining and therefore less of environmental or energetics impact. But with the open model, also create an environment where there'll be a plethora of models that will be trained and therefore an explosion of the environmental impact of the large language model. So I don't know if there's any studies to anticipate, anticipate in the future the environmental impact of all of what we're doing. That's a really interesting question, something we've, we've started to think about. So I don't have an answer, I'm sorry. But um, I was talking with uh, Alex Bateman, who's also here at the, at the conference, and they've recently published on the the green uh, principles, which is exactly around studying impact, environmental impact of the computation we are doing. Uh, so I don't know, but we'd love to look into it. I think that's a short answer. Tomai, you, know, you have I, some I, thoughts on this, or Andrew? I, I have no data or no, no knowledge of uh, but it's a fascinating question. I, I think in principle, the open models are, you know, this is true for open source software generally and open things generally. We tend to be the poor cousins, right? Okay, we have less money than the closed folks for a wide variety of reasons. Not all of them good, but some of them make sense even. And so we are more resource constrained than the closed guys. And so I think we will probably end up using less electricity and water and the like just because we can't afford it. Um, that's not a, you know, it's kind of like why New Zealand is, is such a, a low pollution country. It's, there's no people there. All right. It's not like the people are any better than anybody else. There's just so few of them. Um, and so, you know, maybe we will have less of an impact because of that. 
Um, other than that, it's hard to see much of a difference. I think, you know, technically some of the innovations that have reduced use have come in the open world. Right. So the needle in a haystack hypothesis, can you go back once you've trained a model and extract a submodel from it that is as performant but much smaller? That came out of the academic world, to the open world. Um, a lot of the stuff on efficient training and things like that have come out of, has come out of the open world. Um, although, you know, maybe Google or OpenAI have efficient training things that they haven't published on, who knows. Um, but I, I, I you know, just because of the overall big picture, I think the open folks are less likely to be environmentally destructive than the closed. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to take the last few minutes to redirect us into the direction of thinking about the concerns with uh, any pri uh, privacy concerns, thinking about the massive amounts of data, the possibility that there are linkages across these data, whether Re-identification is a is a problem, and and I'd like to get your thoughts on: Are you concerned about it? Uh, what could we do about it? How can open uh, source models help us? Um, who would like to take the floor? I can start. I think uh, yes, we are all concerned about this uh, issue related to privacy and uh, so on, and. Um, <clears throat> But I think uh, technology is evolving, it's not stopping because our, we are concerned about uh, things like that. But what we have to do is to anticipate, I think, and uh, education is something that um, I believe is uh, very useful for to, 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 to tackle this issue, to anticipate on the impact of, of these biases on, uh, on uh, our society. And education is not only the formal education, but even if I believe in the formal curricula, we need to include uh, this kind of uh, uh, critical topics, even in uh, the IT trainings and so on. And we need to train them to work in uh, interdisciplinarity because if so when people are developing their, <laughs> their solution or their algorithm, sometimes they used to work close as a, a close community of uh, IT developers, something like that. But they, they, they need to start working with uh, social scientists, anthropologists, uh, environmental scientists, and so on, so that they can ask the right question. Uh, and uh, I think that is only how they can fix, uh, at the technical level, the question raised by this uh, uh, researcher from uh, other domains. So I think, and I believe in, uh, long-term education i think mm -hmm. patience again as you said is very important here yeah, Thank you. yeah I'll, I'll echo that I, I was where i was going to go to I, yeah. i'm not concerned about privacy per se i'm concerned about people being savvy enough to make their own decisions about the privacy like you know when i was pulling my lab with the various scenarios i mean you know and i consider you know my lab to be you know among people who are mo most informed about the uses of um and the um, sort of implications of data sharing. And there were some people who were definitely, oh my gosh, I would never you know, throw my data in that. But then there were people who said, yeah, throw it all in. I want personalized you know, uh, recommendations and to do that, right? Um, and I don't think there's a right or wrong choice there, but, but making sure that people are, are making that choice in an informed way, um, I think is key. And it's, yeah, and that's, I think, uh, a challenge. Thank you for being here. I'm going to disagree with you again. <laughs> um, I think privacy is a huge problem here. First, because of the thing I raised a couple of minutes ago about advertising. All right, advertising is more effective when it's personalized. And so, if the if the way that these companies are going to win, you know, make a return on the investment of billions and billions of dollars. Um, not only are they going to advertise, they're going to advertise with every bit of personal information they can find about you. Okay, so I think we really have to worry about that. Second, um, there's this wonderful, uh, I don't know, I'm gonna make it a poll. Who knows about Wild Chat? Oh, almost nobody. So Wild Chat is a big collection of prompts that people have entered into large language models from open models. It's fascinating. Okay, people upload the most ridiculous personali personally identifiable information in their in their prompts. Okay, they had to actually before they released Wild Chat, they had to go through and try to identify PII and redact the names because they were afraid of doing harm. All right, There's, and you look at these things, and you know people give their medical history and you know all this personal information about themselves in an attempt to get an answer. 
Of course, all the companies, by the way, when you check that little I agree box, say that they can harvest that for whatever use they want. So when you're typing that into a, into a proprietary model, you've lost it. I think the only hope we have for a privacy preserving language model is an open one. But, but I mean, just to push back, Jeff, Please. You, well, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> you know, how much, how much of that is, is education, right? I mean, you know, suppose somebody were, you know, really, uh, right. I mean, you know, wasn't getting a, you know, had, had a rare disease, wasn't getting good, you know, support from their, their doctor, whatever, and wanted to put that in. Right. And I, you know, I, I agree with you that, you know, terms and conditions, of course, are famously obfuscated and, you know, we all just scroll through mountains, not the text and hit the box at the bottom. And that's not a great system, but, um, uh, the idea that some people would want to consent to that being harvested and used in, in ways, in products that then might come back and serve them. That's not a ridiculous prospect. Right? I, no, I'm not, I'm not arguing that people shouldn't be allowed to do it. I think that what we do need to pay attention to is what others do with that information. So just answering the question, if I put in all my personal information, I get an answer back. I don't see any problem with that. Harvesting that and using it to sell me shit is a little more problematic. <laughs> Harvesting that and using it to deport me or put me in jail is very problematic. And so I think we need to worry about, you know, my favorite question about AI of all kinds and really technology of all kinds is not what does it do or how does it do it, but to whom and for whom. Okay, that's what we need to think about in regulating privacy. Thank you. Some more thoughts, Melanie or? I don't know if I'm agreeing or disagreeing, Clary. I'm a little bit scared. <laughs> you're not doing, you're not doing. No, so. So thinking privacy as a principle is great. You know, we're like, let's preserve, in, in particular in the biomedical context, right? We, it's important, that's confidential, control access, human information. But what I'm more concerned about when we are, recently we are talking with my team about privacy and, you know, are we allowed to put the data in that environment versus that environment? How do we make sure we have the right security and safety measures? I'm more concerned about the, the harm versus benefit of what's happening to the data. So. I'm working with patient data and people who have had uh, cancer or whose family members have had cancer. And when you talk to the, the individual, the participant, they say, you know, I want to share my data. I want to take my whole genome sequence information, push it on the web anywhere. I don't care. I want you to use my data as much as you can. And I want to get the best treatment derived from my contribution to science. And when you tell them, oh, wait, we're going to have to make to maintain your privacy, there's regulatory challenges. We cannot actually send data from Europe to the US. We're like, but why? It's my data, I told you, I want you to do it. And so, you know, I think the privacy is important and the, the, the harm that could come out of it, I don't think we quite know today. You know, Larry points out, maybe today we cannot use that information to deport people. Maybe in six months we'll be able to. So there's stuff that we know today, there's stuff we don't know. I think we need to consider the benefits and the potential harm. Mm. And to go back to, yeah. to Andrew's point, somebody a couple of years back was saying, has the privacy boat already sailed? Because all our data is already out there, right? Like we will post it on Mastodon and Twitter, the program information is online, how many of us have Facebook, LinkedIn accounts? So, you know, the privacy boat has already somewhat sailed. So there was a a movement saying, you know, let's just overwhelm it. Let's just release everything. It's already all of, the, all of there. We're going to submerge them with amount of personal, personalized data, and people are just not going to care anymore. So I don't know. I think harm versus benefit. Where do we want to go? Thank you. Well, the last one's a rapid fire as we as we come to a close. Then uh, I know this is a general question, but think generally about it and and, and just yes or no. So do you think open source models for AI ML, uh, open source informatics for to be used in the con in the context of informatics, are they a game changer for our field? Um, yes, no? Game changer? <laughs> We've been doing it a long time. <laughs> it's important. We got to keep doing it. Okay, yes. Yes, totally. <laughs> 
Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> 25 more years of boss. <laughs> well, thank you by so the, much. By the way, we have, I, I, wanted, I don't know any other place to make this point, but the automatic uh, transcription machinery that has been used to, to you know, do transcripts of us speaking live spells BOSQ, B-O-S-Q-U-E. And I think we should adopt that acronym and figure out some acronym <laughs> to go with Q-U-E instead of conference. No open source. No, no, no. Maybe but, the, but the forest thing is beautiful. I think we should really go with boss. How <laughs> There you go. All right. Well, those bosques or whatever it was on the transcript should forgive us. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Let's give them a round of applause.